Hello, my name is Tracy Ferguson, and my presentation is on a brief entitled College Prep for All. Um, this is a policy brief, and it talks about what we've learned from Chicago's efforts, and these are the researchers, and the author is Christopher Mazio, and this was based on the Consortium on Chicago School Research at the University of Chicago Urban Education Institute. And this is the citation for all the information I'm about to go over with you. Now, what this was, uh, in 1997, Chicago Public Schools uh, policy changed. It ended remedial classes and required college preparatory cl coursework for all students in the four subject areas, English, Math, Science, and Social Studies, which pretty much equates to four years of English and Math and three or more years of Science and or Social Science, you know, which includes Social Studies. And the research teams at the Consortium on Chicago School Research at the University of Chicago and at the University of Michigan examined the 1997 Chicago Public Schools effort to implement this version of the mandatory college preparatory curriculum. And the comparisons were made of the outcomes that they had before they implemented it and after they implemented the new policy. And they focused on Algebra 1 and English 1. Now, when you talk about opposing uh, views or debates or schools of ideas uh, in regard to mandatory curriculum, the opposing method was a debate uh, that they used for differentiated curriculum. And this, they said that this caused variations in students' academic experiences across schools and within schools. And they also said the depth and the rigor of that differentiated curriculum um, is affected and there's a concern whether it effectively prepares all students for college and careers. And that's why they wanted to go toward a more uh, mandatory curriculum. Now the objectives of this curriculum is uh, to discover, the research was to discover methods to improve the rigor of the high school curriculum and they also want to enhance student readiness for college and career readiness. Uh, they want to increase opportunities for all students to be able to take college preparatory classes because the existing research revealed that students who took high school level course sequences learned more in high school and were more likely to attend and perform better in college than students who did not take these classes. Now some of the key findings from this research was the number one, one was that it increased freshmen taking college preparatory classes. The new policy led to more ninth grade students taking college preparatory classes, especially among lower skilled students. Over 90% of those students with the lowest entering achievement were enrolled in college preparatory English and algebra classes. Now special education student enrollment was affected more than regular education students. And they had a little theory that possibly schools simply may have renamed their remedial courses while students were getting the same experience. Uh, we're not sure about that. Um, there was a reduction in tracking. Uh, ninth grade math teachers reported spending more instructional time on algebra. Uh, the English teachers reported using fewer textbooks, more fiction, poetry, nonfiction, play, script, and scripts in their classes. And there were changes in the instructional experiences of lower skilled students. Students were considerably more likely to earn English 1 and Algebra 1 credits by the end of the ninth grade. Test scores in math and English were unaffected by the increase in college preparatory coursework in the ninth grade. Furthermore, grades declined in both subjects for lower skill students, and these students were significantly more likely to fail their ninth grade English or math course, which of course is not good. And absenteeism also significantly increased among average and the high skill students in both subjects. Ninth grade students um, with more than nine absences in a semester have said to have a 41% or lower likelihood of graduating in four years, which we know is not good. And this new curriculum policy had its strongest effects on both positive and negative uh, on those students with the weakest entering achievement. And compared to the pre-policy years before they implemented this policy, students entering high school with the weakest skills were significantly more likely to earn credits for Algebra 1 or higher level math in ninth grade. Uh, with regard to advanced course taking, students were no more likely to earn upper level math credits after the policy change. Even though post-policy students could take the college prep math sequence up to pre-calculus. 
because now they started the math sequence in ninth grade rather than in tenth grade. That's why. And students entering high school with low math skills did not even choose to do so after they implemented this policy. Um, some more key findings were math grades declined, math failures increased, and graduation and college going rates declined, and some of the course of grades declined, even down to C's and D's. Um, requiring a full four years of college preparatory courses actually made it more difficult for students to obtain the credits needed to graduate, and graduation rates declined with the new policy and new mandatory curriculum. No improvement in college enrollment and retention rates among these students who did not graduate. In fact, students with strong grades, B average or better, were slightly less likely to go to college after the standard college preparatory curriculum was required for all. There were no positive effects on student achievement. Um, and now I want to look at uh, implications for this for state and federal policy. When you look at it, you think about it, reform did not reduce inequities in coursework by entering a skill level, race and ethnicity, and special education status. The policy had no effects on the major outcomes these kinds of curriculum reforms are designed to impact. So as a policymaker, you want to think about how is this going to really affect um, your students and your achievement levels. States and districts implementing mandatory curricula should focus their attention on the quality of classroom instruction and the depth of the task students are working on in these classes. Some more implications for state and pol federal policy. Policies need to address engagement as well as instruction. As long as students are minimally engaged in their courses and attend school irregularly, policymakers should not expect substantial improvements in learning. So think about it. Um, if they're not coming to school on a regular basis, if their attendance is not good, it doesn't matter what class they're enrolled in. Policymakers need to remember content and the structure of courses is the only first step. But real improvements in learning will require states and districts to develop strategies that get students excited about learning, studying, attending class regularly, and you know doing coursework even if it is hard. Now my evaluation of this uh, brief is that it's important because understanding the use of policy must include the understanding that the development and implementation of law can have positive and negative effects on areas outside of the initial intent. So if you, if you develop a policy, you have to understand that it's not only going to affect what you developed it for, but it could affect areas outside of that realm. It is helpful because understanding that policy implementation is just as important as policy development. You can write the best law or the best policy in the world, but if it's not implemented with fidelity and if people are not using honest and forthright uh, actions when they're evaluating, you're still not going to come out with the uh, results that you want. And we should care about this because in order to attain desired results for any endeavor, anything we do with education system, consideration of extraneous variables and effects on unintended targets is always a possibility and it should be addressed within the policy writing and prior to implementation. So while we're writing policies and while we're uh, developing uh, laws, we need to think about what other areas it could affect in negative or positive ways and we need to think about that and incorporate that into our policy writing and also into our directions for implementation. And implementing and developing policies and implementing them, you still need to go back to collecting data after you've implemented it to evaluate the results, see what's going on and allow for revision in your policy writing and in this process because it's important in order to acquire the optimal result, results that you're looking for. Uh, and questions that I had after going over this were what strategies could be put in place along with mandatory curriculum that could result in improved high school curriculum rigor and student preparedness for college and career readiness. They put this mandatory curriculum in place but they didn't think about the extraneous variables so what kind of other things or initiatives or staples or could we put in place to undergird this policy to try to develop some improved results and outcomes? They said that absenteeism was a big factor. So let's look at absenteeism. 
Absenteeism was identified as one factor affecting the results. So what specific factors should be considered when developing policies regarding attendance? And lastly, as educational leaders ourselves, how would you use this information in your own current positions? And I'd like to thank you for um, reviewing this brief with me. Thank you.